Welcome back, everyone. This is World IA Day 2021. Coming at you live <coughs> from London and thereabouts. Uh, we've had a great morning so far with talks from the BBC and Google. Um, and coming up next, we have uh, Ian Piper. Uh, let me just find my notes, honestly. How disorganized can you be as a host? Never done this before working for free. All right. Uh, Ian runs uh, Telluro Semantics, a consultancy working deep in the information plumbing with structured taxonomies uh, in specialist areas like publishing, banking, and law. Uh, he helps organizations get a clear picture of their structure uh, and overcome those everyday content issues like not being able to find things not being able to uh, reuse them, and not even really knowing what you've got in the first place. So Ian's developed a uh, five-step process for successful and sustainable information management. You might have heard about knowledge graphs. Well, here comes the content graph, a model to make the most of content and ensure its longevity. For those of you just joining us this afternoon, uh, if you have a question for Ian during the talk, uh, please just pop it in the chat uh, as we're going along uh, and we'll try and get to them at the end. And by the way, if you have friends who would like to join World IA Day 21, 2021 as of this afternoon, um, feel free to share the uh, veto link with them and they should be able to join uh, like anybody else. So, whether you're considering a uh, top-down transformation or just part of a small team dipping their toes in structured content, here's Ian Piper to get you from cha chaotic content, put my teeth in, to a well-tempered content graph. Ian. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thank you for inviting me to talk here this afternoon. I'm just going to bring my slides up on screen. Let me just, I'm sharing my screen now, and hopefully, all being well, you should now be able to see. Can you just confirm you can see that slide, Mike? Yep, we got you. Great, okay. Okay, so, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna be talking over the next half hour or so about uh, how to apply graph technologies to content management and how I believe we can use these to overcome the most common uh, problems of information management. Now I said chaotic content, which is provocative, I know, and, uh, but I think that's the situation that most of us face daily. Uh, nobody can find anything. Our search engines don't really work the way we expect them to. Content is arranged at the wrong level of granularity for, for reuse and, and repurposing. And where we're classifying content, it tends to be haphazard and based on keyword tagging. And because we work in silos, it's hard to link information between systems and to get a, an holistic view of your, uh, your content environment. So I'm just gonna run through a couple of the kinds of issues that I see through my client work. Uh, content discovery tends to be using a full text search um, uh, in search engines, or tends to be a uh, fixed navigation through some sort of navigation scheme. Problems with this are that search engines don't really understand uh, what you're typing. They only know what you're typing. They don't know what you're looking for. And when we look at uh, the, the fix, fixed kind of storage architectures that are used in many, uh, many, many places, because you can only attach a a particular piece of content at one point, it's difficult to, to store it in multiple locations or to access it in multiple locations. And so you get limited value out of your navigation scheme. Let's look at issues with content architecture. The, the biggest problem to, to, um, to my mind is that content architecture rarely focuses on granularity of content, it tends to be monolithic. For example, in publishing organizations where, where I work, the focus on, is on producing a book and 
the, not the granular content, not the reuse of the granular content that, that goes to make up that book. Content spread around silos. It's chaotically spread across the enterprise with little or no uh, prospect of interoper interoperability. And to me, this comes down to the fact that it's often driven by local short-term or tactical considerations. When you look at content classification, a particular bugbear of mine, even now it's often done using hard database links with internal keyword lists. And these are very limited ways of classifying your content. It's specific to your CMS and it's inaccessible to other, uh, other um, information services. And so it's difficult for tagging to interoperate or to add value across the whole of your, your enterprise. As a practical consideration that many organizations come across, which is every couple of years, they move to a different content management system. And the first casualty of that is any tagging that's been done because it's hard enough to migrate content, let alone the tags that are attached to that content. In summary, it's hard to find content, to reuse it, to repurpose it, and it's hard to get a holistic view of your content across the organization. I'm just going to zero in on search as a way to bring us to, towards uh, knowledge graphs, because in effect, a knowledge graph is a great way to search across your, your business. The, the problem with search, and I'm going to repeat what I wrote a couple of slides ago, search engines don't know what you're looking for. They're not intelligent. They only know what you've typed into the search box, and they have to infer what you're looking for uh, from, from that point. And that's how we end up with 482 million results in many searches nowadays. Here's one that did produce 482 million results. And I want to focus on this to show some of the, the, the trends in, in search that have made things a bit better while not necessarily making them any more uh, semantically rich. Uh, this red box here shows you the kind of classic old school search results. And that's what, for many organizations with internal search engines, that's what you still get chunks of information that are linked together uh, that provide you with the ability to link out to the original, uh, original content. More recently in Google, you've seen the appearance of these kind of editorialized boxes. And sometimes they're, they're adverts, sometimes they're sponsored content, sometimes they're some sort of editorial thing like this. The question that always comes into my mind when I see that is, right, we've got nearly 500 million results. Who is it that's deciding that these three are the ones that I should be seeing? And, um, and I don't have a good answer to that, but it does, it does make me slightly concerned that there's no simple way of knowing what the value of the search results you're getting back are. One thing that has brought some clear improvement is the appearance of the info box or the Google knowledge graph. Uh, and this is a way of giving you some additional contextual information about the thing you're looking for. And it's a really useful addition, but bearing in mind that Google works on largely unstructured information, that this must be a manual process uh, largely. Um, so I'm gonna take the information that we've got there and then redraw that in, in the way that we would if we were building a knowledge graph. So on this image, on this slide, we've got an image of a person and this image represents a person object that we assign that is a proxy if you like for a real person um, and that person is joe biden that if we're building a knowledge graph we would say there are a number of data properties that are associated with that uh, entity and the first one i've picked out here is the first name which is a string of text j-o-e but it's not just a string of text we've provided a meaningful link between the person object and this piece of data. We've said it's a first name. So we're removing ambiguity about what those three letters represent. And similarly, we can add a family name, we can add a date of birth. And these pieces of data can later on be explored. We can ask questions like, show me all people who have the family name Biden. Show me all people born on that day. Besides data, we can also link this person to other people and we can do, do that with meaningful um, what are called predicates meaningful verbs that link one thing to another such thing uh, we can link to educational institutions and that in turn allows us then to ask questions like 
show me all people who are uh, alumni of uh, University of Delaware. This person also has a job, and I'll just go through the re remainder of the, the transitions in this slide to show you how we're building this, this network, this graph of information about this person. And you can see here that once we've got that rich graph of information in place, we can ask questions like, show me all people who have held the job of president of the United States. Show me all people who have been a vice president and also a president. Uh, and so on. Um, so building up a graph like this adds value to what you would get in a normal info box if you can get access to that kind of graph information. But it turns out that if you're working within your own organization, you've got it easier than Google has because Google's limited uh, in its sources to mostly unstructured information in web pages. You, by contrast, in your organizations, control your information. And so you can build models and you can structure it. And you know your knowledge domain, so you can classify your content. And you can build up linked data that helps you get a rich view of your information spaces. Well, that's knowledge graphs. And as the title of my talk suggests, I want to focus in on one narrow component, one narrow type of knowledge graph, which is what I call a content graph. Now, it turns out a knowledge gra uh, content graph is, in fact, a knowledge graph. It's, it's like any other knowledge graph. But the things that we're linking together are content objects, taxonomy concepts, using a semantically designed information model to link all of these things together, link content with concepts, with other content, with other concepts, and so on. If you've got a content graph, this is kind of thing you can expect to be able to get out of it. Uh, you can get greater precision and less ambiguity about what you discover from your content. You can find the things that your content has been tagged with, the aboutness of your content. You can find related content by the profile of the concepts that you've used to tag it or by other similarities in metadata. By jumping from content to concept to content to related concepts to related content, you can transitively explore your knowledge domain. And that means you can get much more information in, of the type of see also or relatedness. If you store a concept graph, as I believe it should be done in a graph database, then you can explore uh, that content graph. You can compare it with other information that you're storing in other systems in your business. You get away from silos. And um, I'm gonna talk more about separation of concerns and future proofing a few slides on from here. Designing a content graph, first and foremost, requires that you build a model for your content, model it at stru as structured concepts at the appropriate level of granularity, that you build structured taxonomies and use them to classify contents. In other words, using things rather than strings. I'll talk about that more on the next page. And although it may seem like a minor point, it's a really important one. Use URIs, use uniform resource identifiers to unambiguously locate and identify all of these components. I mentioned content classification a couple of times. This is old school classification. You take a content object, you make a hard link to a keyword. This content is about mortgages. In a content graph, you do it slightly differently. You create a meaningful link using your information model to an object that happens to be about mortgages. So this object has got a URI, look in the yellow box here, that's the URI for that concept. And that concept has preferred labels in a variety of languages and synonyms and so on. It may have links to other objects, that's the pink box. And it may have additional textual metadata that enables you to unambiguously identify what we're talking about here. And by classifying in that way, you have a very clear picture of what this content is about. There's no doubt what it's about. And when you classify in this way, you're actually, what you're doing in practice is building up a, a triple. And a triple is, you can think of it like a sentence in English. It stores a subject and an object using a verb. So here, the subject is the piece of content, and that's the URI for the content. 
Next, we have the URI, which I've written in a slightly different form, that represents the, the, the predicate, the, the verb that links this to something else. And then below that, we've got the concept that it's linked to. And those three things together make up a triple. And you can redraw that triple like this, where you have the subject, then the verb, then the object. And crucially, when you store that in a content graph, you can interrogate any, pick, any part of that triple. So you can explore using the subject, using the object, or using the predicate, or any combination of those. And this is what it looks like when you collect it all together. Down at the bottom here, we've got a collection of semantic triples that link content objects with taxonomy concepts, or indeed with other concept, uh, content objects. We have uh, up on the left-hand side, your content object. On the right-hand side, taxonomy concepts that represent the aboutness of that, uh, that object. And in the middle, you have some sort of semantic middleware that mediates the process. And when you, when you uh, classify a, a, a piece of content with a concept, then that record, the record of that link, gets stored down into a graph database, along with many billions of other uh, uh, records of other such relationships. And just to repeat, you can store each part of a triple, sorry, you can explore each part of a triple separately or in combination. Let's take another look at a, a content graph. In this case, I'm looking at some instance data and the yellow box in the middle represents a particular content item and all of its links. This is a piece of content. It has a URI, uh, which ends in ABC123. It has a name, which is the title, Applications of Graphene. It's got an author, which is me. It's an object that represents me. And it's got topics that it's about. And in this case, it's graphene. And there are other things that are about graphene as well. So other content items being also about graphene could be deemed to be similar to the content item that we're talking about here. It's also aimed at a particular audience, research, uh, researcher, and it's linked out to other uh, rich objects elsewhere. And the, the, the upshot of all of that is that we start to ask really rich questions like, show me all content that's about graphene and was authored by Ian Piper. And once you've got the answer to that, you can then explore, show me all the other things that Ian Piper has, has authored. Show me the people who have a similar expertise profile to this person and, and so on. I recognize at this point that it's, it's implausible to think that many organizations can make a leap from traditional content management to managing content in graphs like this. But two things I want to say about that. First of all, what you actually show to your users needn't look much different from what you're showing them now. Having the graph underneath your content, or rather underneath your user interfaces, is simply another way of organizing your knowledge. Uh, and the user interface you choose to use uh, just reflects how you want to show that to your users. The second is you don't need to do it all at once. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. And that is my five-step roadmap. And of course, that's a very convenient way of describing it. It doesn't need to be five steps. There's a spectrum of development here, and I've just picked out five convenient points along the road. Let's just start, though. This is a traditional content management system architecture. We have the white box on the left-hand side represents a content item in a CMS, and you can see that it has properties. It's got fields, um, and in fact, Something like Drupal would store it very much like that. You have a, an identifier. And by the way, that turns out to be a URI in this case. And you have a title, you have a payload, you have an author and a date. And in the pink boxes at the bottom, you have keywords. And these keywords are chosen out of a keyword list in your content management system. Uh, you, you usually have some sort of simple taxonomy in systems like Drupal, WordPress, AEM, and so on. So I would say the first step in building a content graph is to build an information model. You don't actually need to make any architectural changes at this point. You're really designing an information model that reflects the world of your content by defining the kinds of classes you want to store and the relationships between them. 
And in the case of content, you'd be looking at the macro and micro structure of your content and the links between your content and other content and the links between your content and concepts. Giving every content object and every taxonomy concept a URI at this point is also really important, but it's not difficult. And at this stage, if we look at the, the schematic diagram, we're still dealing with exactly the same thing. We haven't had to make any, uh, any architectural changes at this point. The next step is to introduce a taxonomy management system. That's an external system that stores taxonomy concepts. And then you simply import the keywords into your content management system. And that's a very straightforward thing to do. Most taxonomy systems will export a new uh, CSV or Excel or some other thing. Most content management systems will allow you to import taxonomy data as keywords. The key thing here is that we now have a taxonomy system that's available outside of your content management system to other services. The next step is to keep your, your tagging internal. As I say, you're still tagging content items with, with internal keyword lists. But now, in addition to storing keywords out of your taxonomy system, you're also bringing in the URIs. And to do this practically usually means that you need to uh, store another slot of data in your taxonomy. That's not difficult. Uh, it's very straightforward to do that in Drupal, for example. But the key thing here is that we've now got a way to link through URIs between the content object, content item, and the, the taxonomy concept. So we've got URIs and we've got keywords that are now stored within the content management system. We need to start introducing separation of concerns. And by that, I mean that you store the appropriate information in the appropriate place and you, uh, you you only store it there so we're starting now to move some of this information in this case the tagging information outside of your content management system and to do that we need to introduce a new architecture object which is the middleware that mediates between the content management system and your taxonomy management system Again, this is something I've done a number of times in organizations and it's not difficult. Note, however, that we've now, in, in the, inside the content management system, we're now storing the URI for the taxonomy concept. And we've got that because using this mediating middleware, we can get to any of the other properties of the taxonomy that we want to. The URI is a crucial thing that links different objects together in this world. And then finally, step five is to completely separate the concerns here. In this particular stage of the model, we've got a content management system that's storing content. It's not storing any uh, tagging information, no, classical, no classification information. We've got a taxonomy management system that stores taxonomy concepts. In the middle, we've got middleware that manages the links. And so this is where the middleware is where you actually do your tagging. And that would mean that you'd take the URI from the content object, the URI from the taxonomy concept, and you'd link them together using the information model that you developed way back in step one. And once you've got that record of tagging from content to concept, that gets stored down into a graph database. That's a bit at the bottom here, the triple store. And so you can see here the blue boxes represent con representing content objects, the white boxes representing the predicates, and the pink box is representing the concepts. And you imagine that there'd be billions of these from your content repositories, from other information management systems that you're using. And at the end of all that, we arrive at a content graph. And a content graph has content objects with, stru with structures defined by an information model stored in the content management system. We have classification information in an external taxonomy management system defined using that same information model. And the links between the two are built on semantic triples based on the model and stored in an external graph database. And that, that graph database, that repository, that is the content graph. That content graph can be explored using content discovery tools. And although I haven't really talked about this so far, one of the key 
benefits out of this is that your organization's knowledge is future-proofed against changes in the TMS or the TMS, because those things are, are managing just the information they need to. And so it's easy to swap one out and replace it with another. We no longer have the interdependencies that, that cripple a lot of our information architectures at the moment. Right, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I'll be very happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks so much, Ian. Fantastic there. Um, I'm going to start with a question of my own. This is right up my street, this stuff. Um, and I'm going to play devil advocate and say, well, this is all very well, but it's, it can seem quite sort of large scale and difficult for organizations to do. How is this better than the way that content's managed at the moment? Yeah. Uh, and that's a question I get all the time, Mike. Um, the way in which information is managed largely in organizations at the moment relies on relational databases. And there's a huge investment in relational, um, in relational design. And so the question often I get here is, why would you, why would you design around a graph rather than a relational database management system? Now, I've got to start by saying I've used relational databases all my professional life. So, you know, I, I see their benefits. They work well when you've got predictable data. They're not so good when it comes to managing large numbers of rich interconnected data systems. When you have to uh, create new relationships between the different classes of stuff that you're dealing with. Relational databases tend not to uh, work quite as effectively. Interrelated data swiftly becomes uh, expensive to manage in a in a knowledge as your knowledge domains become more uh, more complex and you get lots of interconnections imagine the number of joins you have to build graphs on the other hand help uh, when you have massive quantities of interconnected data and when you can't predict in advance what those connections are going to be if you think back to the um the joe biden graph you know that's part of a really rich complex um, set of interconnections and it's comparatively straightforward to build new ones when you want to i didn't mention any of the the children of joe biden in, when i drew that graph but you can add them in you can enhance your information model to to include you know, has child and then in, link the link that that primary uh, content object to another one uh, using a has child relationship that's really quite difficult to do in relational systems um, and I suppose the other thing to mention here is that, is a repeat, I've said it several times, when you build a, a graph on, on semantic triples, you can explore that huge graph of data using any component of the triples, you can uh, either separately or in combination. And that, again, is something that's you know, quite difficult to do by other, uh, other technologies. I certainly don't advocate any organization gives up on relational databases. But when you're dealing with rich content information like this, then you know there are some huge benefits to be had from adopting a graph approach. Terrific, thanks. We've got a question in from Dan Howarth. He's a content designer in the UK government. And Dan writes, uh, if you don't have a CMS as a starting point, say your content is dispersed across different code bases and people's mental models, What's a good starting point instead, other than a blank piece of paper? Um, yeah, well, it, it, in my experience, the, the next most popular place where stuff is found is in file systems. And um, you, can, you can adopt a similar model here by um, having some sort of unique identifier as a starting point for your, your information in your file systems. Uh, and you can still build an information model that allows you to identify the things that you're dealing with. In this case, they are files. You build metadata around those. You build the links between those and the other things that you want to handle, other things you want to manage. Um, and you build a graph out of that. Uh, another example uh, of where, where I commonly see this kind of thing is when an organization wants to um, build a model that um they, they sorry let me just start that again when an organization wants to manage different types of entity that they want to go to link together 
building a model, building a graph-based model is a good way of doing that. And in that case, those things might be held in all sorts of other systems. Um, a recent example I was, I've been working with is an engineering company where they want to link together people and skills and projects and documents and locations. Those are the business entities they want to deal with. And the, the, the kind of graph model that they develop then is to create classes representing those things and then link those together in meaningful ways and associate them with the uh, data properties that they need. So, okay, you, you know, a content management system is one way of doing it. And I've picked that in this case because that's where I spend most of my working life. But you can apply exactly the same sort of principles to other types of information uh, management and build graphs around those. Great, thank you. Uh, Anushka asks, uh, as SEO is about stats, how do I convince the SEO team that this is the way to go? She says the, the team she's working with is still pushing for canonical URLs that contain hierarchy uh, because they're convinced that web crawlers rely on this to result in Google juice, SEO optimization. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, well, I must make a confession at this, this point. I'm not an expert on uh, search engine optimization. Uh, and so I'm not sure how good an answer I can give you on this. But I would say canonical URLs with structure built into them are, in my personal view, not a good way to go, simply because you're stuck with them. I mean, I've, I've been dealing with organizations that have rigid hierarchical uh, content management system structures, and they're really stuck when they want to make any changes because their URLs are fixed to that, that rigid structure. They can't have an alternative place for that piece of content because the, the URL in effect takes you down a particular hierarchical limb of the tree uh, and they can't store the same 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 information in other places so my response to that i suppose would be try to virtualize your your environment rather than having um a, a structure that forces a um forces a rigid hierarchy on you have a virtual hierarchy um, and apply that to your search engine optimization. It feels to me as if that should be quite achievable. In fact, I know it is because I've done it in, in other organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got Mac Girl Sweden who asks, have you got any thoughts on the use of, uh, use of RDF graph databases versus node entities uh, like Neo4j? I don't know what that is. Does it have to be RDF compliant? No, no, it doesn't have to be. I mean, it so happens that RDF is where I do all of my work, but I know that there are other games in town. And um, the, the key thing here is, is it really comes down to the, the, the basic unit of currency that you're dealing with here is, is, a, is having a, a structured, consistent way of linking one thing with another. And to do that using some sort of uh, meaningful uh, relationship, uh, that's where I've been using the word semantic all, all the way along. It's simply a way of linking two things together and making sure that the link that you're applying has some meaning, like first name, last name, married to, uh, alumnus of, and so on, if we go back to the earlier slide that I, uh, that I talked about. Um, it doesn't have to be based on RDF, no. And I know Neo4j is a huge player in this market. Uh, that brings us on to the final questions. Actually, a couple of questions. I'll try and sort of roll into one from uh, Matt Girl Sweden and Isaac Pattis. Uh, it's about kind of, I guess, third party support. Isaac says, "Do you have you encountered middleware that reports on the relationships between search terms uh, and elements in a in a content graph?" Uh, Matt Girl asks, "Have you seen big cloud providers at, uh, having products that support semantic technologies that could be used to create a content graph?" Yeah. Um, there are big players here, and I don't want to advertise any particularly, um, but I'm, and this is not an advert, but these are systems I use and that I find quite effective. I use OntoText GraphDB, which is a massive provider of graph databases, and I use Pool Party, which is, you know, one of the one of the big players in the development of uh, taxonomies and um, ontologies. Um, regarding Isaac's question. Um, for the most part, I think this is a, an area 
that needs to develop. Um, I've, I've developed these kinds of semantic middleware things myself, uh, well, my business has. Um, and uh, for the most part, no, I, I, I'm, I don't know of specific uh, tools that have been designed to do this, um, but they're coming, they're coming. The systems I just mentioned are, um, are actively being developed to um, you know, address the growing need for organizations to work in graphs. And I think usable uh, products for doing this uh, are coming down the track set us pretty fast. Fantastic. Um, there's more questions besides, but we've got to wrap up on that now. Hopefully, Ian be okay. able to uh, go into the chat and uh, talk to you all a bit more. Lots of uh, interesting questions prompted by that wonderful talk. So thank you very much, Ian Piper. Okay. Thank you, Mike.